Welcome to a brand new history show. Grand Prairie, Texas is very pleased for a sesquicentennial project to begin It Happened in Grand Prairie. We will be featuring many important people in Grand Prairie, Texas that have a recall of the history of the past. This very first program is October the 21st, 1985, and hopefully through the sesquicentennial year of 1986, we will continue this very exciting adventure into the history of our past. And we'd like to thank those here at Store Cable TV for helping us with the show, the professionals, and the class from South Grand Prairie High School. Now, on January the 2nd, 1863, a Mr. Deckman filed with the Dallas County Clerk the original town site of Deckman, Texas, which is now called Grand Prairie, Texas. And on March the 20th, 1909, the corporate city of Grand Prairie, Texas became into being, and Mr. S.R. Lively, became our first mayor. From this wonderful city have come many important people, and two of those are here with us today. And we're prepared to begin a sequence of events that we hope you will enjoy about the history of Grand Prairie. And first of all, it's my privilege to introduce Mrs. Carlisle Smith, Weta Smith, who is the co-host for It Happened in Grand Prairie, and who is also our wonderful, wonderful historian and is prepared to chair a history book about Grand Prairie, Texas. Welcome to the Thank show, Miss Weta. It's a real pleasure to be here. You've called me historian for years, and now you're actually turning me into one, I think. I, I think <laughs> that we really are. And Weta, as a, a very important family of the history of Grand Prairie, Texas, you were a Doherty, and the Dorothys have been in Grand Prairie, Texas for a long time. That's right. Uh, my, I guess, great, great, great grandfather came here right after serving in the Civil War mm -hmm. with uh, a motley that was also serving in the, same, in the war. They were together in the same regiment. They came back to Texas. They were both native Texans, but they came back to Texas and came to this area and settled. So it's been quite a while. It's wonderful, and I know that um, there is a sequence of events of their moving. They were located, I believe, in the Mountain Creek area when they yes, first came? Yes, when they first came here, uh, the first Darty farms were in the Mountain Creek area, about where the, the lake is today. And uh, when we come across the bridge coming into Grand Prairie from Oak Cliff, you can see the area where the, the early Darty farms were, yes. Yes, and then they came on into town proper. Yes, yes. they moved into town and uh, settled <laughs> on Main Street. I was born on Main Street in Grand Prairie, which is U.S. Highway 80. Mm -hmm. And I was very distressed when we had to move from there. I remember my father taking his, my, ha my face in his hands and saying, you know, we cannot live on U.S. Highway for forever. But that was not until 1956. <laughs> yeah. We had done a pretty good job of it up until that time. So. And could you pinpoint us uh, where your original home site uh, that you moved from was located? I believe oh, there's a significance to yes. that too, Weta. It's where Don Juan's taco stand is, which my <laughs> husband thinks is very appropriate that there is a taco stand over the place of my bar since I have such an affinity for Mexican food. <laughs> Well, since your husband is our state representative from yes. District 106, I know that it's significant. And later on, we're going to let you talk about the Smiths and his family, yes. but uh, we'll get back to you in just a minute, Miss Weta. Let's go to the girl in the center. Joe Campbell, as the president of the historical organization, you're also wearing a very special hat today since you are under the sesquicentennial committee responsible for history and all of the ramifications of it. And uh, we'd like for you to tell us a little bit about uh, the things that you're doing other than WIDA's project that's under your umbrella, some of the other things that will be coming historically from your committee uh, for the sesquicentennial. I think that all of us, Ruthie, have become interested in sesquicentennial projects and especially in the history of our city. I said Grand Prairie might be lacking in a few things, 
but I think that it uh, has an abundance of people who love it and who are really becoming vitally interested in getting the statistics down. A lot of our older people I know are real cooperative in this. Under the umbrella of the sesquicentennial committee that was appointed by the city, uh, I was blessed with a, a committee of, or a subcommittee rather, of history organizations. And Ruthie graciously and somehow talked Weta into doing the official history of the city of Grand Prairie. And we're real grateful for that. She's been a special love of ours for many years. And uh, there are a number of us working uh, with the AARP and with oral histories of uh, older people and even younger people that we found have a lot of knowledge that are willing to share with us. But the Sesquicentennial History Organizations Committee itself, one of its projects is a calendar. And not too long ago, I was on your program and we explained about this. It's in the process of being made at this time. There's an art contest going on in both the high schools and the winners of that, then their artwork will be exhibited in our calendar. It's also going to be printed by South Grand Prairie High School, I think, under the direction of Dr. Cater Parr. And so those things are in the making. We also have our city-owned homes that will be on tour and that will happen probably in March and many other times uh, during the year that there's a special occasion. We're real proud of the Copeland Museum that is almost uh, furnished. There's a lot of refurbishing being done to it. There's also some refurbishing being done and has been done to the Bowles home. And incidentally, when you talk about ancestors, this is where my old family, the Robertsons, came from and uh, they were on that end of town and on the other side of my family I came from the Watsons and they're Watsons on the west side and in uh, Arlington and Tarrant County but I feel real rich in my heritage of having forefathers and ancestors who really settled in this part and I feel like that my roots are deep and I just have a real special love for this place you go other places and they're wonderful to visit but you come home and it's always so great all right now Joe we're not going to let you get away without a little bit of a historical interview. Now, Watson Cemetery has a very special meaning to you, and I'd like for you to uh, tell us a little bit about your involvement in the cemetery there. Uh, some, some heritage, I know that your mother, Anna, is so involved in that. Would you uh, give us some recall about the old cemetery? My mother was a Watson, and her father was J.B. Watson, Sr., and uh, he would be a hundred and something years old right now and of course he was steeped in history and tradition and uh, I've always been real grateful for the things that he taught me but it was his uh, father, grandfather who came here from Tennessee and when their wagon came in he was a friend of Colonel Johnson who is at Johnson Station and when they came into this part of the country they camped where the Watson Cemetery is now one of their party died, and that party is buried there. It was the first person in the cemetery, and there are old stones around that uh, out there today. So it's all real special out in that part of the country, even though it's built up, and Six Flags and the Hilton and the Sheraton, and all of that is out there. There's still that one little special spot that still remains as it always has been. Now, you have an activity out there at least once each year that that I know that I've joined you on several occasions uh, tell us about your cemetery cleaning and and how you uh, have a sort of a revival every year with all the old settlers it has been on the second Thursday of each year as long as it's been in existence and uh, that was the time of the year when the farmers felt that their crops were laid by and that they could take the day off and spend it uh, doing what they wanted to so they would come with their families and as I have heard from when I was a little girl that they would bring tubs with their food in it and they would bring quilts and old sawhorses with planks to make the tables but they would spend the day clean the cemetery and have a real good time visiting with one another and just this last year since there's no shelter at all and the weather is so hot in August they decided they would have it the second Thursday in September to see if there would be um, a better attendance. And a lot of the people are old and not able to come and can't stand the heat. But it is a wonderful day of fellowship and people thoroughly enjoy it. 
Well, would you like to name drop some of the families that joined you all in that uh, particular uh, cemetery association group last September? Some of the old timers that have uh, come along. Uh, well, you ask me now, I can't remember. <laughs> That's all but right. the Wheelers is an old, old family from mm -hmm. out in that part. And there was a family of Themesters. There's a family of Millers. Uh, mm. I, I know that nearby we have the Ford Bellamy, Bellamy Cemetery, Cemetery that's mm -hmm. near ARA out in that uh, particular part of the country. And I know that uh, Mr. Goodwin, who was uh, very important in the beginning mm -hmm. of Grand Prairie, that had a section of 640 acres of land, according to our Peters Colony uh, land map that we have in our background that's part of our setup for it happened in Grand Prairie. And I know that his wife was the first person uh, to be buried there at the Watson Cemetery. Is there anything else you'd like to tell us about uh, the history of your family before we go back to Weta and ask her for a, another minute wrap up before we leave? Not except uh, the fact that I grew up in Shady Grove. I was born in Arlington um, under an oak tree about where Luke's Pontiac place is now, I think. Uh -huh. yes. <laughs> but uh, we moved to Dallas for just a little while and moved back to, out to Shady Grove, and that was where I attended elementary school and went to Grand Prairie. And back to what UTA is now was North Texas Agricultural College. So I just feel this is uh, where I belong and wouldn't be happy any other place. And maybe by the next time I can think of something real interesting to tell you about my past. <laughs> Wonderful. Weta, we'd like yes. for you to name drop a little bit about your family, about your uh, father and mother, and about your grandparents. Uh, we have just about one more minute, and you've got to tell, round it off for us well, in a few minutes. Well, if, if your name is Taylor or Doherty or something of that sort, you're probably kin to me in some way if, if you've been in Grand Prairie for very long. And uh, there are still a lot of us here. and. We don't get together as often as we would like, but we're still very much in contact with each other and uh, care about each other a great deal. And, um, you know, part of my past means a lot to me, and I hope it does to all the people that we'll interview over the next few weeks, as I'm sure it does. I'd like very much to encourage you to have a Taylor Doherty family reunion oh, between I'd now love to do and it. the end of 1986. <laughs> thank you. So that we can get a tape. <laughs> thank you very uh, a much. A historical tape. It would be real fun. Thank you. And thank you both for being with us as we have begun our historic trek back through the ages of Grand Prairie, Texas, and hope that we'll bring some very exciting information to you. And we'll be right back. Welcome back to the second half of our brand new historical show, It Happened in Grand Prairie, many long years ago. And to help us pull all of these things into focus, we have three very, very important people that are working in their realm of history in Grand Prairie, Texas. Now, there's no one that has a license to do oral history alone. So there are three different avenues that we know of that are going to be approached, and possibly you know of others. And we'd like to know about it if you know of other oral histories that will be presented during the next couple of years. First of all, we'd like to bring on Joan Longorio of the Republic Bank. And Joan, with her very special talents, is doing not only an oral, but a video history of Grand Prairie and Joan. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Ruthie. We're just so glad to have you with us. And we are just so delighted at Republic Bank to be able to contribute something to the sesquicentennial celebration. Wonderful. All right, we'd like for you to explain maybe some of the uh, things that you've gone through in getting the, all of these people together, how many meetings you've had, and what's your real interest, the topics that you are focusing in on. Would you do that for us, Joan? And tell us a little bit about your program. All right. We started 
in the early winter of last year having what we call bag lunch reminiscences. Uh -huh. We have a little bag lunch and we have people that we invite to come and talk and people that we invite to come and listen. We have had one that began with the, the old airfield that Republic Bank now stands on. Mm -hmm. That one had six pilots who flew in to what is now Republic Bank, but once was Lufut Field, and once was, um, uh, Ch I, I can't remember what, what its name was, but um, this Curtis airport, Wright. Curtis Wright, mm -hmm. this airport was started in the 1920s and was a very important part of the development of flying in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. So that was our first one. All right. Since then, we have had one that focused on uh, the old schools, one that focused on businesses, one that focused on um, hmm. farming. Yes, farming. Uh huh. Okay. And next week, we're going to have one that talks about Avion Village and the war years, World War II years. So we have had them several of them in the last year and plan to have several more. Have you had a pretty good reception from the people that you've invited to attend these? Oh, yes. And we are just absolutely overwhelmed at the number of people who come and how excited they are about it. It excites us too and we are videotaping them. The videotapes will be ready to be given to the library at the end of all of this. Now these tapes will be unedited just as you're doing them at these meetings or how are you handling that, Joan? No, I think we're going to do some editing. I haven't decided yet how much. Mm -hmm. But this is bringing a lot of history fresh to Grand Prairie, Texas through this avenue that you all have provided. I now have a mailing list of over a hundred. Great. And next week is the next one. So yes. you're making history each and every time you do all of this. Now, Joan, before we leave you, we'd like to ask you uh, a little bit about yourself personally. How long you have been in Grand Prairie, where you came from before you came to Grand Prairie, Texas. Look out into your camera and tell us a little bit about a historical interview just with Joan Longorio, former teacher. Tell us a little bit about what you used to do. I've been in Grand Prairie f since 1952. I was a um, school teacher from 62 until 1980. Mm -hmm. My five children were all born here. They are graduates, two of Grand Prairie High and three of South Grand Prairie High. So you can see that when we have that particular game, <laughs> I have to stay very neutral. Yes. I taught school at South Grand Prairie High, so, well, you know, that's sort of my special. Sort of your special school. Yes, yes. Yes, and where I noticed that with this wonderful twang that you have, I know that you aren't from Kentucky or Georgia. Tell us where you came from. I'm from South Texas. Okay. I know that doesn't, I don't sound like it, but I really am. My father is a Texan, my mother was from Kansas, and I turned out to have a South Texas drawl. Wow. My home is Edinburgh in the Rio Grande Valley uh -huh. and in the winter time when I look out here and see all the dry and desolate countryside I still ask myself why aren't you in that beautiful valley in the Christmas at Wonderful. Christmas time. Wonderful, Joan. And now let's go to our next oral history expert, Marguerite Patton. I know that you wear a special hat as the chairman of the Commission on Aging. So I know you're into we old folks just a little bit, uh, but I understand that through the sesquicentennial appointments that you are the sesquicentennial oral history champion. So tell us a little bit about what you forecast for that group and um, how you're going about your oral history. Okay. Well, as being a member of the sesquicentennial committee, uh, I'm trying to work with any of the senior citizen groups on any project. Mm -hmm that they might uh, want to come up with for the sesquicentennial. And of course the oral history is near and dear uh, to my heart because we did start preliminaries on this back uh, during the bicentennial celebration 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. So fortunately Grand Prairie's given us a lot of time and is allowing us now to pick that ball back up 
and uh, the local uh, uh, American Association of Retired Persons, the ARP, has agreed to uh, work with us on this to make this their sesquicentennial project. And they've appointed the very best chairman that anyone could have, and she has her a nice committee and uh, we're trying to support them in every way we can. We'll be doing interviews too in any way that she wants us to help her get this all drawn together. Uh, now, Marguerite, for the sesquicentennial, your oral history, do you plan on working with any other group other than uh, the, uh, say, status citizens? Are you going into the warrior group uh, to get oral histories from that direction or, say, from a group of school teachers or past preachers or in any other direction for oral history taking? No, we're not going to any particular group. What we are zeroing in on is strictly the history of Grand Prairie. And uh, we do have guidelines, a sheet made up uh, in order when we're interviewing anyone to kind of spur their memory if they remember when the inner urban came through Grand Prairie or when they remember when uh, Highway 80 was not straight and all this, this sort of thing. And, uh, uh, each one of these interviews will be on tape in their entirety at the library and then when we are through with our interviews we will make a master oral history tape and excerpts will be taken from each one of these because when you do a few interviews you find out that people remember things a little differently sometimes. So an oral history sometimes is not total accuracy, but as Ms. Meisner remembers, the interurban did so and so or such and such a thing happened on such and such a date. All right, now, uh, both of you that we've just talked with, uh, I know that you're going to make all of this wonderful information available to Weta, Weta Smith that's doing our history book for Grand Prairie, Texas. And I know you're going to be a very important arm of research for her. And you all have um, already told us that you're going to help and do all of these good things. But before we get to Ms. Meisner, who is very exciting to us, Marguerite, would you tell us a little bit about your family personally, how long you've been in Grand Prairie, maybe what brought you to Grand Prairie, and uh, a little bit of those things, Let's would see. you? Well, I grew up in Dallas, the big city, you know, yes. to the east, and uh, my husband and his family moved to this area during the Second World War in 1942, and he is a graduate of Grand Prairie High, graduated in 1948, and uh, I met him in 1952 in Dallas, and we were married here in Grand Prairie in 1954, spent two years in the Army, and we've been here in Grand Prairie ever since. And, uh, uh, I just think it's the greatest place in the world. I love it. We've raised three sons here. And, uh, and you would name those for us. Oh, yes. Wayne, Steve, and Jimmy. Yes. And uh, Wayne and Jimmy are married. Wayne lives here in Grand Prairie, too, with our three beautiful grandchildren, uh, mm -hmm. two grandsons and one granddaughter. And Jimmy and his wife, Kim, just blessed us with a new granddaughter who's two months old today. <laughs> and as a past president of the City Council of PTAs, that you have given very much to the community through that and through many other avenues, but of course um, I was more closely associated with you during those years. And uh, we appreciate so much that you're helping us to come up with uh, relating to the history of Grand Prairie, Texas. If I might say too, we <laughs> hope that our committee is uh, uh, in another avenue uh, hope to do an oral history that includes the Watson community as well as the, the Law Reunion settlement. And uh, I'll talk to you about that at some future That time. sounds exciting. And also, I would like to salute you for all of the things that you have done for the little Presbyterian Church, the West Ooh, Fork my Presbyterian Church. Church, at celebrating 115 years in 1985. You've been important to that history, to seeing that it is perpetuated, and to seeing that they got their state marker, that they got their Grand Prairie significant landmark, and many other things. So well, not thank only you for your help, PTA no, and no. history and all of this good stuff. And now to a wonderful lady from Grand Prairie, Texas, Elizabeth Preston Crabtree, Meisner, and you must know all of it because each and every one of those is an important uh, step to your being here today. Now, Elizabeth, as a longtime Grand Prairie, and I would like for you to just tell us all about yourself first, and then we're going to get to the job that you're doing for oral history. We're going to reverse it on you, would you? Well, 
Uh, of course, I'm Elizabeth Meisner, and I have lived here all my life, which is 76 years. Wonderful. And uh, I am a descendant of two very early pioneers in this community. Uh, one was William Gilwater Preston, uh, of Prest Fort Preston, an old Preston Bend, but on the Red River, but that's now in the bottom of Lake Texoma. Uh -huh. And <laughs> then Preston Road is still with us. Mm -hmm. But uh, Gilwater, as we call him, because <laughs> the family likes that name, I don't know why, uh, was the restless explorer type. Mm -hmm. And uh, having come, having seen, then he grew, would grow bored and he became very fascinated in what was on the other side of the mountain. Mm -hmm. And he would move on. He died in New Mexico because Texas had become crowded and is mm -hmm. buried in an unmarked grave. Um, on the other side, there is an immigrant Dutchman by the name of Bernoulli which has been anglicized to mm -hmm. Thomas Vernoy, mm -hmm. and uh, he was the settler type. Mm -hmm. uh, the tradition in the family is that he walked from Peekskill, New York, because he had heard that there was cheap land in Texas, and mm -hmm. I suppose he didn't have any money. Go right uh, He uh, came and took up land, and very quickly began to build a house, uh, acquired a bride, and started a herd of cattle, uh, and uh, ranched oh, all in this area. At one time, his boundaries were, for the cattle, uh, Chalk Hill, mm -hmm. the river on the north, mm -hmm. and as far as they could walk to the south and west. And uh, some of his, the, the Bernoy family is still here. I have lived here, as I said, my 76 years, and I just shared the common childhood of all children in Grand Prairie, and it seems to me it was rather simple and protected home and school and church mm -hmm. and Saturday. Oh, and Saturday was different. Yes, you, you, you went to town on Saturday, mm -hmm. and the people from the South Country and the North Country came in to buy their goods for the week, and then you saw all your relatives, and you bought ice cream cones, too, <laughs> on Saturday. I can remember that Mr. Page, Mr. J.Y. Page, had an early dime store here, and he had a a visitor's bench simply for people to come in and put the packages down and sit there and wait until the cousin or the uncle or the aunt came by. Wonderful. Uh, We're going to let you finish the rest of the story on our very next taping. You're going to have to come back, Elizabeth. You have entirely too much to tell us uh, for us to cut you any shorter than that. But we promise you, you're going to be next to tell us about when you were a school teacher, SMU, Roy Preston, and all of the wonderful things. It'll make a wonderful history tape for us, and Joan's going to bring you back at the very next opportunity. And this is Ruthie Jackson reminding you, history is as we do. singing sonnets to the Colorado sky and the sound of California gets you down if you're in the country living and partial to the sky then come on down to Texas 